Today we are going to be diving into another Toronto murder case from the 1980s. This case was actually requested by a viewer and when I started looking into it, I was thrown down a rabbit hole. When you do a brief Google search on this case, not a lot pops up. The first articles I found were very vague. There wasn't really many details. It was just like really basic stuff. It took me hours and hours of deep diving, going through web sleuths, going to old links and old newspaper articles to even compile all of this on this case. Because for some reason, a lot of the information on this case isn't really public knowledge. It's not in the main articles that come up. This case isn't only odd with how this little girl could have went missing, but how her murderer hasn't been caught 40 years later. There's talk of police mishandling the case. There's suspicion of if the killer is really even the killer. And people saying that it's very odd how this case is portrayed in the media. And this case isn't as straightforward as is being depicted. And honestly, I kind of agree with the last part. The whole thing about the killer not being the killer, I can't really get on board with that one as much. But this case is definitely portrayed as something very simple when it is not. And today I'm going to break it down for you and bring you all of the strange facts of the case of Sharon Morningstar Keenan. Now, before we get into the horrific details, I wanna talk about the nine-year-old victim in this case. Sharon Morningstar Keenan was a fourth grade student at Jesse Ketchum Public School in Yorkville. She had long, dark hair, brown eyes, and a dimple in her right cheek when she smiled. She loved art and drama and wrote plays with her friends and put on puppet shows in the streets. She once drew a poster of a girl with long, dark hair in a flower field and wrote on it, I love everything. At the time of her death, Sharon had a seven-year-old sister named Celeste and a five-year-old brother named Summer Sky. Sharon's parents were 35-year-old Linda Keenan and Brendan Karen, who was an unemployed printer selling food dehydrators from their home at 493 DuPont Street. They were described as products of the 1960s, where the love of man and nature was the way of life. And it may also lend to why their children had such cute hippie-esque names. 16 months before Sharon was murdered, CBC would make a documentary about the family's food dehydrator business, and this is where we get one of the only video footage of Sharon. This 30 frames of 16 millimeter film is the only known moving image that exists of Sharon Morningstar Keenan. It comes from a CBC documentary made 16 months before Sharon's murder about the Keenans and their food dehydrator home business. This case takes place on Sunday, January 23rd of 1983 in Toronto, Ontario, Canada. And we all need to remember in the 1980s, kids weren't as watched over as they are now. Kids would run around the streets without parental supervision and they were only expected to come home before the streetlights came on. So it wasn't odd that afternoon when nine-year-old Sharon and her mother were on a walk and she asked her mother if she could go play at the park with her friends. It was warm for late January and it had been raining that morning, but by the time that Sharon and her mother Linda had gone for a walk, it had stopped. Linda agreed and said it was fine, but the exact time she told her to come home at, I've seen depicted as 4 p.m. and 5 p.m. It's a little skewed what time exactly it was, it seems. Either way, she was told to come home at a certain time and she was expected to be home by that time. But just like that, around 3 p.m., Sharon would head off to Jean Selbe Square Park alone, which is a park off Brunswick Avenue that's surrounded by what are now million dollar homes. Sharon was very familiar with this park and had played there many times before. And as you can see from Google Maps Street View, the entire four sides of the park are homes. And this wasn't a secluded park or a park on a main road. It definitely looks like a park that people would feel comfortable having their children play at in a nice quiet neighborhood. Keep in mind though that this neighborhood is bordered by four major Toronto streets, Bloor, Bathurst, Spadina, and DuPont. So just blocks away and you're in the downtown of today's city. Now, I don't know 40 years ago how built up this area really was, but just from all of the old video footage and news reports from the time, it still looked like it was built up. So nine-year-old Sharon goes off to play at the park. Later that day, she didn't actually end up returning home, so her father, Brendan, ended up going to look at the park for his daughter. But Sharon wouldn't be at the park when he arrived. He would end up hurrying the 10 minutes back home, but Sharon wasn't at home either. So he then started looking around the neighborhood, but he still wouldn't find Sharon. At 6.15 p.m., Linda would call the police. Law enforcement would quickly search the area around the park, but when Sharon wasn't found by 10 p.m., Missing persons reports would start going over police radios every half an hour. And these sound trucks would go around the areas spreading the information about Sharon. The next day was Monday, and around noon that day on January 24th, two homicide detectives would be assigned Sharon's case, and a recording device would be installed on the Keenan's home phone just in case a kidnapper called. Police would later find out the residents near the park had seen Sharon talking to an unknown older man, and he seemed to be coaxing her to go with him. No one stopped them though, which is just, it's another conversation for another time. 
there's so many times that I've seen this happen where they're like, oh, I've seen a child talking to this person, but they don't say anything. They don't do anything. They don't go approach them to make sure that, you know, the child is talking to someone they know. It's just happened way too many times. But again, another issue for another day. Either way, Sharon was gone. She'd vanished. Police would continue to search for the next following week, but the searches would lead to nothing. And little nine-year-old Sharon Morningstar Keenan would not be found. It wouldn't be until a week later when police started knocking on residents' door near the park to see if they had any information on Sharon's disappearance. Because remember, all four sides of this park were lined with homes. you think someone would have seen something. Going door-to-door -door would lead police to a rooming house at 482 Brunswick Avenue. And this house was just a one-minute walk from John Sibelius Square Park. Oli, who was one of the third floor tenants, told police that one of the renters that lived on the second floor, who was known as 42-year-old Michael Burns, hadn't been seen since January 24th, which was the day after Sharon went missing. The officers found Oli's behavior and his statements toward the other resident very odd. And then police were granted access to search Michael's room. Now, I've read in some places that police did this without a search warrant, and there was a lot of issues with this. But honestly, after what they would end up discovering in Michael Burns' room, I really don't care if they had a search warrant or not. Because in Michael Burns' room, police would end up discovering a fridge. And inside this fridge was the body of nine-year-old Sharon Keenan. Autopsy would show that little Sharon had been essayed, strangled, and thrown in a garbage bag before being placed in the fridge. Now, I can't confirm if this is true or not, so take this with a grain of sand. A member of Web Sleuths also remembered during this time when Sharon's body was found that it was mentioned an immigrant family lived on the bottom floor. I've seen that this immigrant family came from multiple different countries, so I'm not even going to include it in here because I don't even know which one of those is true in the end. I just know that it was mentioned multiple different places and times that there was an immigrant family living on the first floor. Now, the writer said because this family didn't speak English, they didn't know that Sharon had been missing and that there was even a search going on for her. However, when this family was interviewed with a translator, they were able to give some very horrific details. This family said that they heard lots of noises and thumping around and a child screaming the night that Sharon was abducted. Now, this family allegedly said that they attributed all of this noise to a domestic dispute and they didn't want to get involved and that they didn't really think a crime was really occurring, which is a whole, a whole nother can of worms. I've seen it stated that they were possibly illegal immigrants and they also didn't want to get involved because of their status. But again, that is all just kind of hearsay. But if that is true, those are some very chilling details. To know that Sharon put up a fight and that her ordeal lasted hours. And that statement is very vital in my opinion and it does seem to track. Now the suspect was last seen wearing a black waist length nylon windbreaker, gray pants and a white star pattern dress shirt. But it would take a long, long time for police to identify who Michael Burns was. And with all of that, it led to a lot of people at the time speaking about police mishandling the investigation. And after hearing about all of the mishandling of the Paul Bernardo and Carla Malka case, all the way to the Bruce MacArthur case, which is a really recent one, which is just horrifying to know that this is still happening, I am not shocked to hear that even back in the 80s, people were complaining about police misconduct. However, it is noted that police spent over 20 hours examining Michael Byrne's room, trying to find any evidence of who this man was, because at the time, police were convinced that the name Michael Burns was an alias. So they were looking for clues to try to figure out who Michael Burns' real identity was. It wouldn't be until over a month later that police would finally figure out that Michael Burns really was an alias, and the true monster in this case was named Dennis Melvin Howe. Multiple different things led to this discovery. Police had discovered that the social insurance card that Michael Burns was using at the time actually belonged to a man from Estevan, Saskatchewan, and it had been stolen in Regina four years earlier. Identification was also made after Dennis Howe had applied for Saskatchewan birth certificate under the name Wayne Edward King. They'd also discovered that Dennis had used his mother's maiden name at a homeless shelter in Toronto. And after all of these discoveries, a warrant for first degree murder would be put out against Dennis Melvin Howe. Now, despite taking that long, a photo of Dennis Howe would be put out into the media. It was put on bus shelters. And this photo would get a lot of backlash because people said it wasn't a good representation of how Dennis Howe actually looked. At the time of Sharon's murder, they said he was 20 pounds lighter than the photo. And he looks closer to the photo I have on the screen right now. 
As you can see, these photos are similar, but there is quite a difference. And when you're putting out a photo of who people are supposed to be looking for, you want it to be as accurate as possible. And the other photo was kind of washed out. You can't really see his details. And I think at the time he also wasn't wearing a mustache, but he was known quite a bit to wear a mustache. On top of that, there was also backlash because police refused to bring dogs out to the scene, claiming it was too cold and they were too tired to do so. Yet when Linda described the weather that day, she said it was pretty mild for the year and it was very damp. So with all of that information out, you'd think, done, case closed. They have a body, they have their suspect, but wrong because police would never be able to apprehend Dennis Melvin Howe. Let's chat a little bit about Dennis Howe and who this monster is, because I think once you hear the information on who he is and his background and his past, you won't really be shocked about him killing Sharon. Dennis Howe is described as five foot nine, 165 pounds with brown eyes, a half inch scar under the left side of his chin, crooked pinky fingers, a scar on his left thumb. He's left-handed. He has a small birthmark on the right side of his chest and had very bad teeth. Described as having a small gap between his front teeth and a partial upper denture. A newspaper in Lethbridge, Ontario in 2003 said that Michael Burns, which was again the alias of Dennis Howe was under in the Toronto rooming house, had teeth so badly abscessed his jaw was swollen and he often would get over the counter remedies to help. He had a hairy chest and arms, squared shoulders, a cleft chin and a wrinkled forehead. They have an amazingly detailed description of this man. And you think that he would get captured very quickly with all of this information, all of these scars. He had a very distinct you know, cleft chin. There are cases where there is literally just a sketch drawing of the person and they get captured. Yet with all of this very, very detailed information on this man, he's never been found. Now here's where things are gonna make you shake your head. Dennis was born and raised in Regina, Saskatchewan, where he was allegedly the son of a sex offender, which if true, we've seen time and time again this happen. The cycle continued. Dennis also had four both whole and half siblings that vehemently denied over the years having anything to do with helping Dennis. I'm going to play for you a couple interviews later on in the years that CBC did with one of Dennis's sisters and one of his brothers. I don't know where he got his criminal tendencies. Always in trouble, that boy. <laughs> Beverly McKinnerney is Dennis Howe's half-sister. We, we locked that branch off the family tree many, many years ago. Yes, yes. My children didn't even know he existed. So, you know, I haven't had any contact with him. He doesn't write, he doesn't call. No, I've never had any contact with him. We, I said, we weren't close. Right. Dennis and I were never close. So. I, think, I think Eugene gave him some money once or something. That was... I haven't uh, seen Dennis since the um, last time I seen Dennis. In the 60s? There is this idea out there that maybe the family helped him afterwards. No, no, the family had nothing to so, do with But that's him. important, I think, to hear. The yeah, family had nothing to do with him at all afterwards. He contacted Eugene. I know that. When, when did he contact him? He figured he'd get some money out of him. Dennis also dropped out of high school in the ninth grade, so he never completed his education. His criminal career started when he was a teenager, and he had charges from everything from break-ins to robberies to rape to abductions. He later spent about 15 years, which was over half of his adult life, in prison. And these charges, again, would be from all assaulting women and girls. Dennis has an extensive criminal record for violent offenses. But despite all of that, he would end up being paroled in 1982. He would get out and be given a job at a mill that he would only stay at for a couple days before he would flee to Toronto, get a job at a hosiery factory, and then later murder little Sharon. Dennis was known as a chameleon a con artist, and he went under multiple different aliases such as Michael Burns, Wayne King, Ralph Ferguson, and Jim Myers. 1967, he was divorced from his wife and did not have any children with that marriage. However, please do believe that Dennis does have a daughter from a common law relationship in 1969. He also liked to use the term turkeys when describing people and things. He was also known to be a heavy smoker of players' plain cigarettes and was also a heavy drinker and liked to drink Molson Canadian beer. Dennis liked to do needlepoint when he was in jail and he also worked in the tailor shop and the industrial cabinet shop. Now, while not in prison, he worked in everything 
everything from being a stock clerk to cook, roofer, janitor, millwright, electrician, carpenter, and metal worker. He was known as kind of a jack of all trades, and he would easily be able to get a job in any kind of labor setting due to his skill set. Again, he is spoke of as a con artist and a chameleon. He would have easily been able to flee and go to some small town and get a job in any kind of setting he could try to. So I hope that gave you a good description of who Dennis Howe was. Now we're going to jump back into the timeline and the story after Sharon was murdered. Information would come out the day after Sharon disappeared and was murdered that Dennis was spotted seven hours away in Sault Ste. Marie, Ontario, which is a small town across the border from Michigan. And he was seen here getting onto a bus to Winnipeg, Manitoba. Police say that Dennis had family out west, including a half-brother named Eugene Nelson. And what's interesting is that Eugene was known to give Dennis money from time to time, and he had also gave Dennis the money that got him to Toronto. Eugene was also known to be in regular contact with Dennis before for the murder. So Eugene seemed to be pretty involved with Dennis. Now the other three siblings, once again, vehemently denied having anything to do with Dennis. They even said like they didn't tell their children, grandchildren, whatever about him, that they took him off the family tree. Like Dennis was the black sheep of the family. But Eugene seemed to be a little too close to Dennis and the police agreed. Police would find out that Eugene had taken multiple trips to Montana and Washington state in the time following Dennis's escape. And when police confronted Eugene about these trips, he stopped going on them altogether. Now, why would Eugene suddenly stop going on trips when he's confronted about these trips if he had nothing to hide? That is one of the oddest things I find about this case. Unfortunately, we probably will never know why Eugene was taking these trips because he ended up dying in 2004 and he took that secret to the grave with him. What's really odd though about Eugene going to the Northwestern US is in 2013, an Idaho man named Robert James Miller was actually accused of being Dennis Howe. And as you can see from the photos I have up on the screen, he looks eerily similar to the police age enhancement photos of Dennis Howe. Robert was known as a quirky appliance repairman and an offbeat art collector. And he was brought to the FBI's attention after writing two very long posts on a web forum of unsolved Canadian mysteries called unsolvedcanada.ca. And in these posts, he was writing about his bizarre run-in with a man he thought to be Dennis Howe. Now, unfortunately for him, these posts made people think that he was Dennis Howe. I mean, not only did he look like Dennis Howe, he had a lot of the same attributes as him. They were similar heights. They were both left-handed. They were both heavy smokers and both worked on machines. They both also seemed smart, but didn't seem very educated. And what I found a really odd coincidence was that Robert was actually married to a Canadian woman from Toronto. All of that is very odd. But what did Robert claim happened to Dennis Howe? Robert claimed that he had hired a Canadian drifter from a homeless shelter in Boise, Idaho to do odd jobs for him. This man went by the name of Tommy Ross. And remember, Dennis Howe loved to go by aliases, and his aliases were usually pretty simple names. Now, Robert claimed that him and the homeless man ended up becoming pretty close friends. But after Tommy ended up calling something a turkey, Robert began to realize that his friend was actually Dennis Howe. So he ended up calling a crime hotline and turning Tommy into the police. He then goes on to claim that he's seen two men that he recognized from a TV documentary as retired police detectives, the same police detectives that had worked on Sharon's case. Later going on to say that the homeless man that he believed to be Dennis Howe was probably now bare food in a primitive setting after the detectives had threw him out of a plane naked on their way back to Canada. And after all of that attention, his very odd yet detailed story, Robert came out to say, I am definitely not Dennis Howe, I'm the one that turned him in. Which would be really convenient if you were actually the killer pretending to be someone else and then saying that you ran into the killer and he was dead somewhere. Just saying. So with all of this publicity, the FBI ended up going and meeting with Robert Miller. They took Miller's photo, his fingerprints, and a copy of his birth certificate, and they would later return to take some of his DNA to compare against the DNA that they found in Sharon's body. All of this would end up being tested and they would end up determining that Robert Miller actually wasn't Dennis Howe. Robert Miller would end up going to claim that the drifter's duffel bag was still in his possession and this duffel bag would end up being photographed. And I'm sure if all of this is true, that the FBI would have taken the duffel bag and tested it for things because he claims that there was a toothbrush inside this duffel bag and stuff. So you think they would have done that unless they really just thought that this guy was just crazy and making all of this stuff for publicity. Like, but again, it was really odd that he was so similar to Dennis Howe. Despite Dennis being on the run for over 40 years, there have been multiple alleged sightings of Dennis Howe over these years. At one point, a dentist thought that he had Dennis Howe as his patient. So this man was sitting in his dental chair and the police were called on him. The officers would end up arresting this patient and they would determine that this actually wasn't Dennis Howe, but this man was actually wanted for other crimes. So that wasn't a good day for that guy. 
and another reporter resident in La Flesh, Saskatchewan would end up telling police that Dennis Howe stayed there in the late 1980s. Another person said that he was a dishwasher at a mining camp in Saskatchewan. Another would say that he was a housekeeper in a Calgary hospital, including details that this person chain smoked players cigarettes and called things turkeys. In 1999, a body in Sudbury, Ontario would end up being exhumed when police suspected that this body was actually the body of Dennis Howe. It would end up not being. In 2010, retired homicide detective Wayne Oldham revealed that a $1 bill was actually found in Sharon's clothing. And this led people to speculate everything from Sharon being lured to Dennis's house with a $1 bill, which her mother disputes what even happened. She said Sharon was too smart for that. She wouldn't go somewhere for $1. But people were suspecting everything from that to something even more disturbing and sinister, such as after Dennis essayed Sharon, he stuck the $1 bill in her clothes to like demean her as someone with a prostitute. It would also come out that women's clothing would end up being found in the attic of the rooming house that was linked to Dennis Howe. But all the articles I tried to click on that were regarding that didn't lead anywhere or they didn't work. So I honestly don't really have any more information on that. If you do though, I'm really curious about that down below. However, I do have a theory on to how Dennis Howe lured Sharon. In the CBC documentary that was filmed, it stated that in previous assaults, Dennis Howe had lured women by asking for directions or telling them that he needed a babysitter. So that makes me really wonder if whether Sharon was playing at this park, if Dennis Howe approached her saying that, you know, he had some kids at home, he needed to go to work or something and he needed a babysitter. He could have told her like, I just live right there. Uh, here's a dollar. I'll give you a dollar now and I'll give you maybe like 10 bucks or something later if you come and babysit my kids. And maybe she felt comfortable because she was at the park. He did say he lived right there. She might've thought he was a father that needed a babysitter. And so he walked over to the park to see if someone could come watch his other kids. I don't know. This is just my theory. And that's why she walked away with him and went to his home without putting up a fight. But there's honestly so many theories out there. I'm really curious to hear what your theories are in the comments. Now, people to this day are really skeptical about that upstairs tenant, Oli. And so we're pleased with his behavior. I'm gonna play with you an interview that he did with CBC on, I think it was the day that her body was found in there, but this has really been scrutinized. Well, I was here before he was. I was there about 13 months. He just moved in a couple months ago. When was the last time you saw him? Sunday, the girl disappeared. And no one's been to that apartment since? Nope. Keep in mind, however, that police said the only DNA and fingerprints that were ever found in Dennis's room were of Dennis and no one else's were found. But what really bothers me is that CBC goes back years and years later and they re-interview Oli now that he's older. Because what people were saying is they felt like he was hiding something. They didn't know what it was or why, but they felt like he was hiding something and not saying something. So as you will see in this interview, CBC basically asks them, like, are you hiding anything? I'm, I wanna know what is it or is there anything that you knew at the time that you didn't say? I don't think so. You don't think so? I don't know. <laughs> You're really uh, dig digging kind of deep. That's a police uh, affair. It's not your bu uh, business. No, it's, I'm, I'm an investigative reporter, so I look into all this no, stuff. No, nothing like that. You don't, so you don't know if there's anything that you knew at that time? No, of course not. Now, my opinion, he does seem like he's hiding something. I am not an expert, but in my opinion, the way that he's like crossing his arms and just his whole tone, he's kind of like laughy about it. And when they ask him, he immediately gets defensive, literally saying like, you aren't the police, why are you asking me this? Like, if you really had nothing to hide, why wouldn't you just be like, no, I have nothing. Like, I wish I did, but I have nothing. Instead, he gets very defensive, which I, again, find very odd. It's just really odd behavior to me. But what could he really be hiding? Now, if the immigrant family that lived downstairs is true and real, and their story is true and real, they were telling people that they heard screaming. So if Oli was home, you think he would have also heard the screaming living directly above where all of this was happening. So maybe that's what he's hiding. He's hiding that he heard things that night and didn't report it. So maybe he thinks he'll get in trouble for that. I don't know. Again, he was Dennis Howe's drinking buddy. So maybe he knows more than everyone thinks he does. Maybe he knows nothing and we're all just looking too deep into it. One other fact that I found odd was brought up again from the beginning of the investigation. And this was something that I don't see in all of the main articles that were posted. This is something that I was like digging and digging and digging and then I seen it brought up a bunch. There was allegedly a cab driver that said he picked up Sharon and an older man from the park and drove them to an address. Now the police have never disclosed this address and they don't talk about this address. And this is a fact that I just can't make sense of. The 482 Brunswick Avenue home was just a minute's walk, 100 yards away from the park. 
you could pretty much see it from the park. And this is where her body would end up being found. Now, why would a cab driver come and pick up this little girl, an older man from the park and drive them to a different address? And then what? They left that address, went back to his house and that's where he murdered her? I don't know. I, that one just doesn't track with me, but it's the fact that people say that it did happen. It's not in any of the main articles though. And that police have never to this day, 40 years later, revealed this address. So maybe it was just a false lead and that's why they didn't even bother saying the address because it didn't literally lead anywhere. Or maybe it just didn't follow the police's narrative of the whole thing. Who knows? But it is odd that it's been brought up time and time again in these really deep articles. Another thing I found really odd about this case is one of the officers that found Sharon's body retired very soon after this happened. He did not want to be a police officer after seeing Sharon. And the other officer involved in finding Sharon allegedly had alived himself due to the trauma of discovering Sharon. It was also apparently detailed that it took days before they could autopsy Sharon's body because her body was frozen. But people are saying this doesn't make sense because she was found in the old fridge. And so the question is brought up, can this old fridge get cold enough to freeze her body to the point where it took them a day for her to defrost before they could do an autopsy? That then leads people to question, was she put in a freezer beforehand and then was transferred to this fridge? But again, there's no information on that. This is all just very, very odd facts in this case that don't make sense. The detective that also found her made this quote in CBC documentary saying that Sharon's hair was very shiny, which people also bring up, would her hair still be shiny? so long after she was deceased. Like it's, it's just all very odd. Like, everything about this case is odd. There was also a lot more things brought up on web sleuths and I didn't include them in this video because this video would be 10 years long if I went through every theory every person had. But just know that there are a lot more oddities to this case, things that people brought up that were confusing. There was people in bars talking about Sharon's death and that didn't make sense how they would know this information or why they would say things. Like, there's just a lot of really odd things about this case. So I'm including all the links down below. If you want to go through all of the web sleuth pages, there was like 20 pages, I think almost of conversation and all these old articles and documents and documentaries. I really encourage you to go do so, but again, I'm not including it all in here because this video would be 10 years long. Toronto Police Detective Sergeant Stacy Gallant would be quoted saying, dead or alive, we're looking for Dennis Melvin. How? We have his DNA. Someone knows where he is. We want to hear from you. Now, years later, police are still pleading with Dennis Howe's nieces, nephews, and his child to come forward with any information that they may have, which again is another thing that people find odd. They're like, if you're literally the FBI and like the police, why aren't you going out there and asking for the information? Why are you just kind of throwing it to the wind being like, if you have something, let us know. Like, why aren't you actively going to find this information? I don't know. Again, the family has been interviewed. Apparently it took 10 years before they even interviewed Dennis Howe's other brother. But if the family does know something, they've stayed quiet for 40 years. But I have seen no articles or information where anyone's come forward other than them saying that the deceased brother may be involved with something with that. Now, if they do know something and they've been quiet for 40 years, I, I do believe that they deserve to be punished too because Sharon didn't deserve what happened to her. She was just a little girl that wanted to go play at a park and instead she was essayed and murdered. Her last moments were looking into the eyes of this ugly monster. So if there really is someone out there, They've been quiet for 40 years and 40 years is a long time to be quiet for. I don't think that they'd stay quiet for that long, but then again, there are people that do. Detective Gallant would also say to think that we had a monster in the city doing something like this. That's what I would describe him as, a monster. And he's right. If Dennis Melvin Howe is still alive, this monster has been walking our streets for 40 years. He's been roaming somewhere, possibly hurting other children or other women, and he's never been caught. This man has always been known as a drifter. And as soon as he killed Sharon, he fled. He probably changed his name again right away because he'd be around 82 years old. It's still possible he could be alive. You could walk by him in the street and not even know. I could be serving coffee at work to an unassuming 80 year old man that is Dennis Howe. And I would never know because this case isn't really reported about anymore. Again, it's possible Dennis Howe could be alive out there. The Golden State Killer pled guilty at 75 years old. He was still alive, despite everyone thinking he was dead. It's possible. Over the years, Dennis Howe has been profiled multiple times on America's Most Wanted, and he is one of Canada's number one most wanted criminals. 
There is so much information on this man, yet he has never been caught and he could have fled anywhere. He fled from Regina to Toronto after prison. He then fled Toronto as soon as he murdered Sharon. And he had so much time to escape because it took police a month to figure out who he was. There were so many alleged sightings of him in provinces years later. And he could have easily fled to the US because back in the 80s, it was very easy to go across the border and just assume another identity. Again, he went to a bus station in Winnipeg, which is just across the border from Michigan. So it really makes me wonder, did he even get on that bus? Is there proof out there? The police, you think the police would know if he got on that bus or not? Or did he just go buy a bus ticket so people thought he went out west, but really he went into the US and then maybe traveled up to the Northwest? I, th I think it's very possible in like a very Dexter kind of way that he did all of this murder and then fled and went and lived in the mountains somewhere in Montana. And you would never really know. There is so much wilderness out there. There's so much wilderness in Canada. He could have went up north in Canada somewhere and you would never find him out there if he really didn't leave. He could have lost weight and changed his appearance and stopped saying the word turkey or stopped smoking players playing cigarettes and drinking Molson Canadian beer. He could have changed his whole identity and he could just be out there somewhere right now. Like literally right now, which is just mind blowing to me. And in my opinion, I don't think this man stopped if he is alive out there somewhere. I don't see how he went from committing all these crimes to murder and then just stopping for 40 years. I think that it's possible that this man could be a serial killer and he's just never been caught. Someone out there knows something and you may not even know that you know. But then that also brings you back to they have his fingerprints. You think if he committed all these crimes and he was in jail so many times before this murder that he's not the smartest criminal, that how did he get away with it for 40 years if he's been committing crimes this whole time? Because if someone caught him somewhere, they could have ran his fingerprints and it would have popped up in a database because again, they have his fingerprints and DNA. You think that he would be caught if he was still committing crimes unless he just got lucky and he somehow has gotten away with it all. So where is Dennis Howe? CBC filmmaker David Rigen made a documentary with Linda Keenan. When I found it, I was kind of excited because up until finding that documentary on a web sleuth forum that I, again, there wasn't much information on this case. There isn't photos. There's not really any interviews because Linda never did any interviews really. So I think this documentary is really important for this case. You also get to see the detectives that I spoke about that were involved in this case and hear from them. So I'll have the Vimeo link below and I recommend that you go watch that. In the end, we have to remember that the story isn't just about a prolific monster escaping the police. A little girl was murdered. One of many little girls that were murdered back in the 70s and 80s in Toronto. I don't know what was happening back then. Why so many little girls were being murdered and essayed and disappearing, literally vanishing in the thin air back then and have still never been found to this day, some of them. It's disgusting. And again, no one's really talked about this, which I think is wild. I've searched YouTube, there's not much on it, but I think we all need to remember the little girl at the center of this case, Sharon Morningstar Keenan. And I think her memory needs to be kept alive because this little girl did not deserve what happened to her. She just wanted to go play at the park. Maybe one day she'll finally get justice. It gives me the creeps that this man, this monster could be out there somewhere and was out there somewhere if he is now dead. Just out there. And there's so many more of them out there and it really makes you think just, ugh, you could be walking by people like this every day and you would not know. I just want to say thank you to the viewer that told me about this case. I had honestly never heard of this one. I never knew it would be as deep as it was. I really thought I was going to come into it and do like a quick like 10 minute video like I have done on some of the other missing girl cases from Toronto or murder cases in Toronto because there isn't that much information on them. And at the surface, there wasn't much on this one either. It seemed very, again, cut and dry. She went to the park. She was found in this refrigerator a couple doors down. This man disappeared. But this case was a lot deeper than I ever could have imagined. So yeah, if you ended up liking this style of video, doing a deep dive on an older case, let me know down below. And if you would like to subscribe so you can see more videos like this, please do turn on the little notification bell so you do get notified when I do post videos like this. With that, I'm going to let you go and I will see you in the next case. Bye.